Zebra is a Danish architecture and design firm led by Mikkel Frost, Carson Primdale, Kolja Nielsen, and Mikkel Stesinger. And since 2001, they have been creating architecture that moves, inspires, and encourages positive change in people, stemming from the desire to create sustainable and lasting impact for the stakeholders. When with projects that span across the globe and with many international recognitions, today we are joined with Mikkel Frost as one of the founders to talk about architecture that moves people. So thank you so much for having us and thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure to talk about our passion. First, can you tell us about your studio and also your design philosophy? Yeah, um, our studio was founded in 2001, as you just uh, pointed out. And um, our, break, our background actually between the partners is that we are school friends from, from high school. So we met when we were seven, I was 16, actually Carsten was 17. We met with Carly when I was 18. So that's, a, that's more than 30 years ago, it's a long time. And uh, so first we were friends and, and, and school, school friends, and we decided to study architecture and eventually to start the, the firm. But it was always mostly about friendship. And I think even today, that's what keeps us together. Uh, so we have a very special connection and a very special atmosphere in the office. And so over the last 20 years that we've had the business, we have um, we've worked with many different types of projects, many uh, different scales from very small, actually, summer houses, all the way down to actually industrial design, all the way up to rather large uh, planning uh, areas. I mean, master planning, obviously also large buildings and so on. But we've primarily worked with educational buildings, cultural buildings, and then lately housing and also offices. That's our sort of, our main, our main focus. But I mean, it's everything and it's everywhere. The last, uh, yesterday actually we were pre-qualified to design a tower in uh, Tirana in Albania, which is something we've, we've never done before. And I think it's, it's something that we, we like to do new things that we've never done before. And we, we actually quite believe in the, in the potential of doing something that's quite new. So you have to study hard to get acquainted with that kind of a task. And that's also what makes it interesting to be an architect. For so many years that you can keep developing and keep uh, and keep uh, learning. Our design philosophy, I think, has remained the same uh, for a couple of, of decades. Um, the way we talk about it kind of changes along the way, and I suppose that maturing as a person and an architect inevitably shifts the focus and the language about architecture a, a little bit. But in the end. It's, it's always been the same, which is to create, to try to create a balance between the brain and the heart, between something that's intellectual and something that's emotional. Because for us, architecture is both, and it should never be just one of the two. So an example would be that any kind of, of, of architecture you, you, you do should have an intellectual meaning or an ideology, something that's for the brain, so to speak, uh, almost like a philosophy, you could say, or an aim, a goal to do something specific. And then on the other hand, it should also have an artistic uh, quality to it. And it should also work simply as an object or a space that makes people, that, that kind of moves people, uh, even if they don't understand the background and the intellectual properties of the project, whatever has kind of driven the the thought behind everything, they should just, um, you know, feel something when they're in the space. It should be spaces for human, people-friendly spaces for, for, for well-being. It's a little bit like, I think it's the same in every art form, really, and architecture, obviously, is an art form as well. So if you're into, if, if cooking is your thing and you've taken cooking to gastronomy where it's an art form, yes, you should be able to just enjoy the food. You should be able to just eat the food, taste it, and feel great about it. But at the other hand, you might also dive deeper into things and find that there's a philosophy behind the food. Maybe all the materials or the, that goes into the food is locally uh, sourced. Maybe it's all sustainable foods, whatever. There can be a deep sort of theoretical background to something that's also a very emotional experience. Right. Yeah, I like that you also touched upon it being like an emotional connection within the people. So what makes designing for the senses so important? And in what ways can we 
architects invoke, evoke or promote certain emotions? I think um, for us, at least in our office, it's become more important over the last 10 years, I would say. I mean, great architects have always been able to design for the senses, I would say. And great architecture has always been about something that you sense and experience, of course. But over the last 10 years, at least in Denmark, um, in our business, I've seen a tendency to measure everything. So you start measuring the air quality in the building. You start measuring the amount of daylight that comes into a building. You start uh, measuring yeah, air quality, acoustics, basically everything. And it's something that's done by engineers and driven by engineers. And it's all about numbers, right? So let's say you measure uh, the traffic noise for a housing scheme. It's just a number or it's a diagram with colors. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really say anything about how a space is experienced by a real person with real senses. You might have, the, you, you might have a measuring from an engineer where the numbers say that everything is bad, everything is wrong, you can't build here. But maybe if you go there, other things will affect the way you experience the space for real. Maybe trees or the sound of water will interact with the noise from the traffic, making the place bearable and actually an okay place to be, even though the numbers say that it isn't. Yeah. Or a space can be too dimly lit. If you measure it, there's not enough daylight according to certain requirements. However, the space is beautiful and people love it. So what is more important, the numbers and the measurements or the real experienced emotion of being in that space. Obviously, I think if you ask a thousand people, a thousand of them will say, well, it's the real experienced thing that matters and not the numbers. However, however, in our business, we are led and misled by measurings and numbers carried out by engineers. So it's important for architects to take charge again and say, listen, forget about the numbers. Well, not forget about them entirely, but Yes, look at the numbers, but do not make the numbers a religion because numbers are just numbers. They are not reality. You have to really sense a space and evaluate it with your senses and your own heart and your own emotions and just kind of not look too much at the numbers. That's why it's so important. It's more important than ever because otherwise we could just throw away everything we experience and just look at numbers. It would be a very, very poor world to live in, in my opinion. Yeah. And I guess that's also how, I mean, it's kind of hard to quantify and you don't need to quantify. That's the problem. Numbers are so easy, right? It's just a number. You can make a little scheme or a little graph. Everybody gets it. It's we almost don't have a language for what you experience with your body and your soul when you enter a beautiful space. How do you even describe that in words? It's not, I think, I think the language doesn't quite add up to do that. You can't really do that with words. So how do you communicate it? How do you explain it? How do you argue? You know, when you talk to a client who asks the client to spend a num number of, of money on, on a certain space and you say, it's going to be great. And he says, yeah, can you, can you show me? I was like, well, I can show you a rendering or I can show you like the VR glasses or whatever. It still doesn't quite do the trick and the language definitely doesn't do the trick. Then you fall back on the numbers and you're like, well, the engineer says it's not, it's not enough daylight and or the air quality or what are the acoustics or whatever much easier that's that's a frustrating that's a frustrating thing and we are we are trying to develop a language and we are trying to develop methods in order to 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 do to do this and i have hundreds of examples of of kind of being stubborn as an architect because i have experience as an architect i've trained my senses over the last 30 years I've been in many spaces, I have many references. I've tested many times what it means to go from a drawing to an actual space. I remember one space we did, which is the, um, it's a dormitory that we did. It's called Grundfos Kollegiet. And I wanted to convince the client to clad the entire atrium with mirrors to create an endless, like an endless space, but also to drag down daylight and also to improve social interaction between people because it works like a mirror. So you can see who's underneath you you get much more contact with other people moving around in the building. And the client kept saying, well, I'm afraid people will be seasick in this space. I'm afraid people will not be able to orientate themselves in this space. And I kept saying, listen, it's going to work. But I had no arguments. 
the, my only method was to be stubborn, 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 and convincing and kind of just not give in because I believed it so much. In the end, we built it and the client said, thank you. Thank you for persisting. Thank you for being so stubborn. My point is not that I managed to convince the client. My point is I didn't actually have any tool to really talk about it because it's emotional. It's something you experience with your senses. You cannot measure whether people will be seasick in a space or not. We have to rely on the architect and the architect's experience. And we almost don't have a language for it. And we did renderings, of course, but it was impossible for us at the time. This is 10 years back. We didn't have the machine power to actually do VR experience in a mirror space with endless mirrors reflecting and reflecting and reflecting. The machine crashed. We could just do a still image. That's what we could do. And it didn't quite do the tricks. It did do the trick in terms of convincing the client. So, well, it's just an example of what we are struggling with. When, uh, when we are dealing with intangible uh, things. Right, but what have you developed or what have you used to be able to communicate that? Well, <clears throat> to be honest, <laughs> we're still working on it. <laughs> I, I can say that we have certain methods that we use, but just, just, I mean, just acknowledging that here is something we need to do that's the first step to kind of find, okay, we have a problem. Numbers are taking over. Engineers are starting to dominate way too much. And they have, they have no sense of, of actually designing a space. They just master things and they just deal with numbers. So that's the first thing. You, you acknowledge that there's an issue here. Then, of course, what we try to do is to develop our language. And then, of course, inform the client and say, listen, client, these are just numbers. Have you ever been in a space that you loved and say, oh my God, the numbers are great here? No, you've never been in a space saying that. You've been in a space and just enjoyed it with your senses. So just talking about it might turn things around. I'm not sure we'll ever find a method where you can kind of document how a space is going to work one-to-one -one for people's senses. You have to build it actually and experience it. But, but it's also about uh, reclaim or kind of rebuilding the trust in an architect. Uh, that's always an issue. I think, especially if you're a young architect and you don't have a lot of references or a history of success, it's super difficult to convince a client. As soon as you have a bit of, as soon as you've built a few houses that are great, people will listen, obviously. Um, it's like inviting a, a musician to compose something for a party that you're having. If that musician has already have made a few smash hits, you trust that he'll be able to do it again. If it's completely uh, unknown uh, musician, he can be the biggest talent. People will not trust him until he demonstrates the fact that he can actually do it. So it's, I think also as we mature and have get older, have more experience, it's, it's easier to convince clients. But honestly, if that was your question. A real sort of method to kind of demonstrate this is going to be emotionally impactful. That's 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 quite that's quite difficult. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> so, how do you work with sustainability at Zebra? Well, that's a that's an interesting question for a, for a, to ask a Danish office in many ways because we've gone through a. We've gone through various phases. I think in this in the in the early zeros in 2005, six, seven, we actually started dealing with sustainability. And I think I think in a way we were kind of first movers as an office. And then legislation was implemented. So within our building regulations, which is updated every second or every third year, uh, we started to see uh, demands on energy consumption within the buildings. So in Denmark, at some point in 2015, just to get a building permit, your building would have to have a really low uh, CO2 uh, carbon dioxide footprint. And a lot of clients in 2015, they knew that the, the building codes were being updated in 2020. So they wanted to actually comply with the 2020 because nobody wanted to sit there with an outdated building within a couple of years. So legislation has really driven uh, sustainability in many ways in Denmark. And I think just complying with the building codes, I think you're already at, at a very high, uh, high level. Uh, and many of the things that you can do in other countries in terms of detailing and, and so on is actually, it's 
prohibited uh, here. So for a while, we didn't really talk about it because we kind of had the feeling that, well, we just have to do whatever's in the billing code and then we're kind of good. And we forgot to actually explain uh, when we went to foreign countries and listen, guys, you have to use more insulation. If you use, it, which is a super simple, stupid thing, have to use more insulation because then you have to spend less energy on heating or cooling, depending on what country you're in, if you're in a cold or warm country. Simple, simple, simple things like this. We actually forgot about promoting that outside of Denmark. So we've come back to that now, obviously. And we try it whenever we build abroad, we try to implement some of the things that we do here in Denmark. Then obviously we've also been talking about, that's sort of the latest development in the office. We've been talking about the, the paradox that, that if you really want to be sustainable, you maybe you shouldn't build at all. And the thing is that we've got plenty of square meters already. In fact, if you look at the number of square meters per person in housing, it's been increasing for 50, 60 years. I think the average today in Denmark is 50 square meters per person in Denmark. And if you go back 20 or 30 years, it was half, half of that. So we've got enough square meters. So the question is, why do we keep building? Well, obviously we keep building because it's a business. But the smarter thing to do in terms of sustainability would be to recycle materials or entire buildings, and then obviously build less. If you're in a situation where you have to build something new, let's say you're, let's say you're building a new library, that's something you've decided is the right thing to do. We can't recycle or retrofit the old library, we have to build something new. Then you might wanna think about how can we make a smaller library that still works. So also the amount of square meters you, uh, Amount of square meters you spend on any building, you have to be very cautious about that because maybe if you think about logistics, you can actually cut square meters and make a smaller building. In a school, for instance, if you look at if you look at a school, a lot of the spaces are empty a lot of the time. If you can plan right, you can actually make a school with less empty spaces. So every if, in the ideal building, every space is being used twenty four seven. That's the most efficient building, but most of the time it's not like this. An office uh, space is, is empty uh, after four o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon. In the afternoon, so we have to think about different ways to plan the way we use our buildings so we can build fewer square meters. And obviously, retrofitting old buildings, uh, recycling old materials, which means that when you build something new. You have to keep in mind that you should be able to take it apart again so the resources you are using can be recycled. That's sort of, I think, the next thing we're going to be looking at is how do we, how do we design buildings that allows the next generation, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, to actually recycle the materials in an easy way. Right, or in other words, also making something that's like as flexible as possible, right? For like day use, okay. night use, like for future use, for now use, past use. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that the best, the best uh, metaphor or analogy I can come up with is the Lego. If you have, if you think about it as Lego blocks, you build something with the Legos, it works. Then you take it apart, you build something else. Lego is like the perfect sort of picture on how we need to build. Do you want to share one of your projects um, that allow for such flexibility or that has yeah. great connection with the users? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So it's in terms of flexibility, it's it's something that we've just started doing. So I cannot present you with handfuls of, of, of those types of buildings. Um, it's rather new to think this way. And one of our one of our obstacles, I think, is that we're not, I mean, as architects. We are just um, we're just one of, of, of many contributors to, mm -hmm. to actually building a house. There's a client, there are the builders, there's the, the engineer, there's the contractor, et cetera. Many, many people are affecting um, the design and the, the way we're going to build things. Obviously, economy is a big driver as well. And I'm not saying that architects do not have an influence. We have a huge influence, but we do not have 100% influence. So first of all, you need to convince the entire building industry, which in Denmark is based on, on concrete, which is a quite, a, quite a heavy, heavy um, way to build in terms of, of of your carbon dioxide footprint. It's it's not a it's not a super good method actually. Mm -hmm. 
So we have to kind of change the entire building industry, which is really slow. But we have done projects, obviously, that can be taken apart. I think one example would be the children's home of the future that we've built in Katalina in Denmark. That you can basically take that entire building uh, apart because uh, it's, it's a brick facade, but the bricks are not put together with mortar. They're actually hung on a skeleton of wood. You can start by taking out, taking off uh, all of these um, pieces of suspended uh, brick. Um, then you can dismantle the layer of wood that is carrying all of the bricks, et cetera. And you can, just, you can take out the windows. It's all components, basically. Uh, that would be an ex that would be an example, and the skeleton actually within the building, the top the top of it, the first floor is a wood frame, so you can take those out as well. The base actually is concrete, so that's a bit more difficult, but that of course can be taken out again because it's it's delivered as elements, so you can actually move them and then you can crunch them, or, and you know you can uh, cast it into new concrete or use it for for filler or something like that. So I think that's a good example of a building you can actually take apart. We are in Denmark taking, we are recycling bricks quite a lot, but mostly from buildings that are 50 or 100 years old where the mortar wasn't as hard as it is today because it had less cement in the mortar back then. So there are actually, there are actually um, factories here where uh, bricks are cleaned and they are sold again uh, and new houses are being made uh, with these bricks. And that's, uh, that's, an entire, that's an entire industry. The bricks, they actually, the used bricks cost the same as a new brick because there's a lot of labor that goes into cleaning them sure. and pre preparing them for being uh, for being used again but that's one of the other things is that i think we have to realize and say openly that if you want to build sustainably it's simply more costly yeah it costs more money but it's also better so why don't you want to pay a little more for something that's better so maybe you build a smaller house because you plan it well but you build in the right way, which is more costly. So in the end, it will cost you the same, but your house will be slightly smaller, but much better in terms of, in terms of the sustainability parameters. Um, and that's, it's a, that's an entirely different way of thinking that what, what we have brought up with, so we have to change uh, the mindsets of, obviously, our architects ourselves, but also the clients that we work with right. and the contractors and the builders, et cetera, et cetera. Right, yeah, because it's an economy that needs to have everyone agree on this same concept. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Lastly, so what is your take on the power of, uh, or the impact of architecture? Yeah, that's it's uh, <laughs> um, for anybody listening to this uh, podcast. Uh, you probably, if you think about it, you can probably guess that you guys have sent me the questions beforehand. And it's really, it's really a question that I struggle with. And I'm, I've, been, I've been asked that question before, also actually decades ago. And I kind of, <laughs> I am an architect. So on the, on the one hand, I, I believe architecture can kind of save the world. On the other hand, I also know that we're not exactly curing cancer as architects. That's not what we're doing. In a way, architecture is a luxury for privileged people in wealthy countries, right? If you are struggling for your next meal, if you are struggling to have clean water, you're not thinking about architecture and design. You're not discussing whether a wall should be white or off, white or actual white. You don't care about that. It's like, it's kind of a luxury that belongs to the next level. So in a way, architecture is super important and I spend my entire life doing it. I'll, I'll, be, I'll keep doing this till I, till I drop. So I think it's important and it's very fulfilling to work with, but it's also kind of a, a luxury. So it's not your basic human need in that sense. Architecture is not important. On the other hand, in, in a society like ours, a civilized society with schools and libraries and, and hospitals, it's super important. I, I definitely believe that you'll get well sooner in a beautiful hospital with beautiful spaces, a beautiful view to a forest or whatever. You'll definitely get well quicker than some factory looking white, sterile, unpleasant, uh, artificially lit, horrible <laughs> factory type of, of, of hospital. Absolutely, I believe that for sure. And, and I also believe that, that um, the average person living in some flat somewhere will thrive and have a better life and a better family life in a, in a beautifully designed apartment with a great view 
Is that a crummy, a crummy bad belief for sure? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm speaking with two mindsets here, here in a way, um, because yes, obviously architecture is super important and you can get depressed and you can get a headache from being in a, in a horrible office all day, right? It would, no daylight, just sitting in a cubicle in the middle of a huge space in some American skyscraper, that's horrible. Um, on the other hand, there are, there are more important things as well. I think, for instance, in Ukraine right now, they're not worrying too much uh, about architecture and design. So, yeah, it, it, really, it really depends. It really depends on, uh, on how you decide to deal with that, with that question. Yeah. But I mean, every day when we work in the office, every day we design something here, we think about the people who are going to live in our spaces and we think about their well-being and everything we do is based on empathy. We really want people to have a great experience, like a musician doing his best to play a beautiful piece of music or a chef trying to cook a beautiful, amazing meal for the guests in the restaurant. That's what we do here as well as architects. We really strive hard to to give people the best uh, experience with the, with the conditions that we have. Can't think of a better way to end. We yeah, really appreciate uh, that you remind us that more than, that more than what we see, uh, architecture is more about people and not just uh, not numbers. And also it's about what people feel, experience, and hopefully it's something that uh, people can grow in and cultivate continually to become something that lasts a long time, right? And stays relevant for them a long time. Absolutely, and it's not only about what you see, it's also about what you feel with your hands when you touch a material, what you smell, if you can smell the wood of a, of a timbered space or whatever, the acoustics you can hear with your ears, et cetera. It's, it's, it's all of the senses in a way working together. And what you see is influenced what you hear at the same time, obviously. So I think, all of our senses kind of collaborate at the same time, which is something we, we, we tend to forget because we spend so much time with our iPads or our telephones, which is just a visual experience. It's not a tactile experience. It's not about smell. It's not about temperature, but real architecture and real, real spaces are about all of our senses. Perfect. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing today. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure to talk to you.